Hey everybody, welcome back to the Lucky Dog Podcast. This is your host, Elias Roush. This podcast is sponsored by EliasRoushMedia.com, photo, video, digital media production. Today we are discussing Outer Banks, Season 2, Episodes 1 through 5? We might cover more episodes, but as we continue on, I honestly keep on watching these episodes i'm not looking at the episode number i'm just kind of continuing on so i know i've watched at least through five so we'll cover through that at least that many we might reconfigure how many what episode what what specific episode we're on uh, a little bit later and if we know that we're on six or seven but i'll definitely give you a heads up and we're not going to jump into uh excessive spoilers um up front yet i'll be very upfront with all the uh different types of episodes that were going on and each episode does feel very much like a different type of an episode so season two of episodes uh of the outer banks episodes do a continuation on the from the first season it's the uh the the gang is trying to just uh you know uh, get the royal merchants gold and so season two episode one John B. tries to evade capture as he zeroes in on the gold, but a promise to Sarah may derail his plans. His fa- uh, friends face life without him back home. So like many, many different types of media, uh, there, there's tons of different types of media that have groups of kids or groups of gangs of friends in the first season or first movie. And the second season, a lot of time, will... Uh, divert the group and divides the group in some sort of fashion and just like uh, those tropes I kind of believe that Outer Banks falls within those tropes they separate the group so at the end of season one just to recap uh, we have John B and Sarah stuck in the middle of the sea they're found by uh, a cargo container ship that it happens to be going to the same place where the Bahamas uh, to the uh, Nassau where the, the Bahamas uh, where the gold is. And so, um, yeah, we, I, I felt like it was a little bit convenient that that had happened. And I had started to realize that there was a lot of convenient writing in some of the parts of this show. And, uh, some of it bothered me more than others. Mostly it was still enjoyable and felt organic enough that it kind of just like, I could sweep it under the rug. Um, season two does have, uh, some more glaring parts about it that feel much more, in the realm of uh, uh, not as organic storytelling, in, in my opinion. Mostly because, uh, I don't know, I just didn't feel that everything that had happened in season two was, uh, like I said, organic and felt natural to what the characters were written as in the first season. Um, so... With having the group divided in season two at the at the beginning of season two, you know, was it is it worth it having no um, uh, having no John B and Sarah with the majority of the Pogues and the rest of the Outer Banks quote unquote family? Um, I think that it's it, it picks up from where it started, and again with the chases, again with everyone thinking. Uh, that John B and Sarah are are dead at this point in in episode one, but I gotta say that th- there's parts about it that feel very convenient, and even in further parts of the season that feel way way more convenient. Things are just swept under the rug. Uh, when people are, re- I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say like anybody specific, but if people are in legal trouble. There's almost no repercussion for like over half of them, um, and I do feel like it, it. We're losing believability on the organic side of the storytelling, and it's like, is this what we signed up for? Mm, I I don't know if that's what I signed up for originally, um, when watching the first season because the first season felt like a much more natural progression of having you know pogue life. It felt like these young bucks just kind of get. Uh, entangled into this crazy story and it's like what how are they going to deal with this Um, this uh, crime the royal merchant the death of John B's father Sarah's father Ward and Rafe all the craziness they're getting into and how that's affecting uh, Pogue life as well what I gotta say is 
most of it felt natural. Season two is when it starts to feel a little bit less natural. Um, so let's continue on. Uh, and like I said, nothing from like the cinematography standpoint or the production value of this show feels like it's gone down in any any way at all. I don't feel like what my biggest gripes are about the show in season two is that it's it's mostly the storytelling that's having to turn these characters uh maybe not against each other but i don't think that everything that they're doing is uh, exactly organic uh for for instance kiara i really am not there's there's a dynamic between uh pope and kiara that feels so unmatched and feels like forced and laid upon and um they just it's a will they won't they kind of situation it's like it doesn't feel like one of the more interesting parts of the story um and a little bit strained in some part in some way and they do feel like they have more like family energy than like like relationship energy i don't feel like they are in that in that zone so let's go to episode two. And when I say let's go to the next episode, um, expect spoilers for that specific episode. So episode two, uh, The Heist. With time running out, John B. and Sarah strike an uneasy bargain. Kiara, JJ, and Pope search for the evidence that could implicate Ward and Rafe. So... Um, I do feel like it would be very natural for everyone to be very upset with um, how things would be left on such a small island, such as uh, the Outer Banks and whatnot. Um, the the relatability of having you know people all know who you are. I, I I'm sort of from a small town as well, so it's like everyone kind of bumps into each other. Everyone knows who who you are. Everyone knows everyone. Um, uh, you know, the the more people that we get into town, the, the less it's like that. But um, with just saying that, oh, hold on, I got a call coming in. Hold on, this might need to take this. Oh, hold on. Sorry, I got a call from. My buddy, I didn't know if it was an emergency or something like that. Uh, yeah, so what were we talking about? Episode 2? So episode 2, yeah, like I was saying, when you're in a small town, everybody is like, uh, everybody knows everybody. And uh, that's for better or for worse. And so at the beginning of season uh, of the season, you know, all the pokes are pissed, basically at the entire town, because almost everyone thinks that John Beast killed this sheriff. I mean, he's basically been framed. And so with saying that... Um, episode two, they are starting to kind of go a bit way more back into the fold of let's figure out how to, uh, you know, uh, bring John B and Sarah back. I think by episode two, they figure out that, um, I don't remember if it's episode one or two that they figure out that, uh, John and Sarah are alive, but I gotta say that they are doing an ass job hiding uh, like Sarah and Sarah and John are not smart with being uh, uh, incognito about um, trying not to get caught. I gotta say that there was multiple times in the first episode where John is just like blatantly lying to Sarah. He's like, "I'm not gonna go get this. I'm not gonna go get this gold. I'm not gonna go fuck it up." And then he goes to Ward's house, busts open the thing. The gold's there. Basically, get him, you know, busted almost immediately. Um, but there there seems to be so much more friction with John and Sarah and less, I guess, romance, I guess, um, between the two in season two. And this first half of the season feels like really rough waters when it comes to just the relationship aspects of almost all the characters. I, I almost, I, I'm not getting like a full 180 vibe, but it's like, the world has completely changed to the point where it's like, I'm not quite as enjoying the ride as much. And the way that they're writing some of the characters is not, it does not always feel the most organic. Um, like there's this friction with Kiara and, uh, her family and it feels so half baked. It feels like, you know, 
uh, you don't understand me, you don't understand Pogue life, and so fuck you, fuck this, and the mother is just, you know, all right, get the fuck off my, get, get out of my house kind of thing. It's like, it really does feel, I guess from a more realistic standpoint, it does feel like there is, um, those are how families argue, but that doesn't mean it's like interesting writing at all. I don't think that that serves for interesting writing at all. Um, but with saying that, let's continue on. Uh, Okay, with time running out, John B. John B. and Sarah strike an uneasy bargain. Um, the uneasy bargain, I believe, is with uh, the individuals that are the. I th I want to say they're Bohemians that were on the container ship that were trying to kind of blackmail John B. and Sarah at the beginning, and uh, turn them in for the fifty thousand or whatever the the, the reward was. Um, kind of mixed feelings about them. It felt like really obvious that they were going to be part of the show up front because they were giving them so much screen time and they didn't feel like super organic actors. They, they were just kind of okay and nothing against them or anything like that. I just thought that the family felt very much like, all right, so they're totally going to be a part of the story. And they ended up becoming way more part of the story. Um, from, from one side, they were kind of going against John B and Sarah and then John B and Sarah have to like, uh, make a uh, a deal with them and basically tell them they can have like a, a percentage of the gold. I was like this, these deals that these kids are making. I know that in real life, uh, the guy that plays John B is like 30, but dude, he's making striking bargains and doing all this stuff. Like he's, uh, <laughs> I don't know, like, like he knows what he's doing and it doesn't feel like you're just instantly going to give like 10 million up. I don't even remember if John knows how much exactly is in how much gold is in there. So it doesn't even have a number in his head. I know Ward tells Rafe at one point and shows Rafe, I think second or third episode, Rafe and Ward go down to the Bahamas to check out the, the gold. And essentially that there's like a half a billion dollars in there in gold, which is like, holy shit. So, um, yeah, there is uh, some good set pieces with the you know the chase scenes and stuff like that. I always like a good chase scene in Outer Banks. There's always that. Um, when Kiara and JJ and Pope are looking for um, uh, the evidence and stuff like that, uh, Rafe and I think his name's Barry or Benny. I forgot what the what that one guy's name was. Um, the guy that sells them drugs and just does dirty stuff with them. Um, <laughs> uh, they try to like flood flood the uh what is it called the sewer system where the gun that is implicating ward um uh, sorry ward and rafe is basically trying to conceal the evidence and when they're trying to get kiara out of there i was like are they gonna fucking drown kiara in this i was like jesus oh uh this was intense and so i was like good set piece good set piece i liked it um scary as hell um and uneasy as hell I, it reminds me of uh the show escape from danamora escape from danamora had this one scene where these guys were um trying to escape a jail cell and they're trying to get through this pipe and benicio del toro is so fat in it on purpose he's supposed to be fat and he's like getting stuck in this pipe and it was just giving me this claustrophobic feel just like that uh and i was like oh my gosh anytime a camera is telling the characters they have to go through a pipe honestly that's more scary for me it makes me so uncomfortable than uh most things they show uh so episode three season one episode three prayers a desperate scramble for help lands John B. and Sarah in questionable surroundings. Pope receives a mysterious summonings to an out-of-town meeting. There's this whole implication with this side uh, individuals. I don't even have their names at this point, unfortunately. I kind of didn't do my due diligence on the side, side quest that is happening with Pope. But there is this 
wrangling in of Pope and how he is related to these individuals that were on the Royal Merchant. And I don't remember exactly the names. Of the they were. I think he says they were. They. I think they said they were specifically. They were slaves, and they ended up with the gold or some sort. Got this key and. Pope's family knows where the key is or something like that and this whole I don't know this whole implication of this third party trying to get the key for the gold and all that stuff and uh, this whole stuff I this stuff feels like sloppy writing coming out of nowhere and because she was not to my knowledge I don't recall this lady being part of the first season it feels like she's kind of out of left field and just like a whole nother entity um that is kind of coming in and I bet she'll come in towards the end of the la- end of the season but with just saying that um I was just like uh this is uh, the most questionable thing about it is is a good writing I'm my personal opinion I think it's a little sloppy and of course it leads to another chase scene but they do get this. Uh, I feel like they're using her paralysis as like a, a quote unquote creepiness. I, I I'm not saying it's creepy, but I feel like they're trying to like you know use her as like maybe she's like weak or she has. Um, what did Walt Jr. have? And she has whatever Walt Walter White Jr. had in Breaking Bad and, and does in real life. I can't remember what he has. Uh, it's like some sort of paralysis. I'll think of the name in a minute. Anyways, she, uh, I feel like she's supposed to look quote unquote weak, but then she has the muscle to go with it, which I don't even understand who this lady is. I think she says she was, you know, the gold was rightfully hers, but you know, really was it? Everyone thinks everything's rightfully theirs. Um, let's see what else we got. Hmm. Episode four, low on gas and strapped for money, John B. and Sarah run into trouble. Into trouble. Later, Pope's appointment in Charleston takes an anonymous turn. And so, I kind of did get a little bit of spoilers of the fourth episode, just talking about how Pope gets in a little bit more involved with this uh, this family. I got I wish I had a little bit more information about this family. Um, but long story short, uh, this is when the crew is getting ready to start to. To come together, and uh, I think is John Bean. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's when everyone meets up. I think homecoming is when everybody meets up in Charleston. Uh, John B and Sarah have to like bump into this one random table and. Uh, do the old skedaddle, you know, oh, oh, I'm sorry, sir, let me take your wallet, screw, and then <laughs> they literally steal it. Uh, I do kind of like those little side quests and side hustles that they do, but overall, um, no, not many complaints about episode five. I do like how it feels like we're all coming back together. I can't believe it took five episodes for them to come back and have the team back together because I do feel like many characters we might not think about um, – how how good they perform and how how likable they are as characters i think i don't like john b when he's not with the pogues i could easily see john b ending up like a uh, quote unquote kook but um i feel like john b as an actor the guy that plays john b he works so much better when he's bouncing off these other guys that the pope character the jj character um, I find John B a little bit dry. I think I've, I've been trying to figure out how to pinpoint this character. Cause originally I thought he was a little bit stiff. The voiceover was a little bit dry. I couldn't really figure out what, what was going on. But then when he's hanging out with his buddies, I can totally see it. So that's what it is, is, is kind of like how uh, I personally think like Harley Quinn works so much better when she's bouncing off other characters, not just in the standalone scenes with people that don't, we don't really know you know it's she's better when she has uh, a batman in the scene she's better when she has uh, uh a dead shot in the scene she's better when she has people to bounce off of um john b and sarah they 
I feel like they kind of mellow out in a way that I'm just not nearly as interested. Um, and I think it was episode three. Was I, was it episode three that, uh, okay. So I'm a little bit confused about, let me see. I'm, I'm not supposed to be confused. You're supposed to be confused. Uh, no, no one's supposed to be confused. No. <laughs> um, so I think it was around episode two or three where Ward and Rafe are in the Bahamas. And I think that is when uh, Sarah is shot, and when Sarah is shot by Rafe, that's when that's when Ward and Rafe find out that. Uh, so let me let me rewind. John B and Sarah know that Ward and Rafe are in town, and so they stage a heist with the Bohemians to get the gold. They end up getting the gold, and then in that in that process, Sarah is shot. Ward and Rafe think Sarah is shot and possibly dead at this point. Um, Sarah ends up going to I think it's like a veterinarian doctor or something like that, and um, I don't even uh, vets aren't called doctors, are they? I, I a veterinarian, I guess. And uh, this, uh, this, there's a whole scene where I was like, "Are they gonna kill Sarah Cameron at the beginning of season two? I was like, "This is now. This is some Game of Thrones shit for your ass." I was like, "This is what I'm talking about." I was like, not like I wanted her dead or anything like that, but I was like, "This is some stakes. This is some uh, unpredictable storytelling that I was like, I didn't see that coming." And I kind of. The more the season went in, I was, you know, the whole time I was like, Sarah, you Sarah? I, I was thinking, I was like, oh, Sarah's going to make it. Sarah's going to make it. You know, I was like, and I was like, I don't know. Is she going to make it? And then uh, at the very end, uh, John B's like, all right, all right. Um, uh, he's like accepted it after he's been throwing things around and stuff like that. And Sarah's just like lifeless on there. And then somehow you, we get the very last second beep, 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 beep. And like she's coming back, and the doctor's like, "What the heck is going on? She's coming back to life." And so Sarah doesn't actually die, and I think that was episode three. And I would have said that would have been really ballsy, and I honestly think it would have been really progressive growth for the show. It would have been progressive growth for. Unfortunately, it would have been sort of like fridging for the sake of the main character. But it would have made John B. grow, and it would have showed that there were stakes. I don't necessarily think that they need to always take out the female love interest to have the main character propel forward. But it does feel like a lot of times this character, you know, this will happen. They'll they'll come very close to death, and then you know, beep 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 beep. I mean, tons of movies and stuff have done that um, trope as well. But I, I, this was the longest I've ever seen somebody just like die, and I was like, oh my gosh, I don't think they're coming back. Um, you know, without some like serious voodoo magic. Um, but she, she came back and it was all good. Just brain dead just a little bit, but came back, came back. No problem. All good. So anyways, sorry, this review's kind of been all over the place. I, I feel like my brain was kind of all over the place when I was watching it as well. Wasn't as compelled for the second season, unfortunately. And it's not due to the value of what's going on. It's, it's mostly just feels the, uh, the pacing in this season feels a little bit off, and it. I wonder if it's myself. It could be me. I, I want to be honest because I saw tons of memes. I saw a lot of people say that they binge season two and didn't know what to do with their lives after. And so I kind of wanted to have had the same feeling, but I'm not getting the the same pacing enjoyment as I was with the first season. The first season I felt like I... I was like, uh, two episodes, three episodes a day. I was easy, no problem. Now I'm having, I'm feel like I'm struggling to get like one or two episodes. It feels a little bit more chonkier, I guess, as of episodes. I haven't looked at the run times of them, but I believe some of the run times are a little bit different. They might be a little bit thicker. So I believe we are in the darkest hour. Okay. JJ cooks up, this is episode five. JJ cooks up a risky plan to help out John B. Pope hunts down information about the key. Kiara and Sarah deal with fallout over the pogues. Um, 
so like I said, there is a lot of tension in this season, and I feel like some of it is placed upon themselves and themselves putting it in putting themselves in situations where it's like, all right, y'all really didn't have to do this. Y'all didn't have to go back. You didn't have to, none of this really had to happen. And, um, I, I felt like, I don't know. There's, there's things that happen. Okay. So it's easier to kind of break it down by character at this point when you're in episode five. Episode 5, J.J. cooks up a risky plan to help a John B. This was really... I did. Everyone cooks up a risky plan for something. It normally doesn't work, but I guess J.J. was like, alright, this will buy us 10 minutes. J.J. is, I guess, the only one thinking straight in this, this season. Um, John B. Uh, sorry, Pope hunts down information about the keys. And at this point, John B., I believe, is in jail. Um, John B.'s taken in jail... And, uh, you know, I think everybody thinks he is, uh, he is guilty at this point. Um, Pope hunts down information about the key, Kiara and Sarah key, sorry, Kiara and Sarah deal with the fall, fallout over the Pogues. And so I do, uh, I do like the Kiara, Sarah dynamic, like having a little bit of female, uh, voice in the pogues but i do believe that it's not exactly um it doesn't come together naturally i i, I really i don't like what they've done with kiara in se- season two most uh mostly episode six the druthers john b wrestles with sarah reconnects with a former f- uh, when sarah reconnects with a former flame uh ward's web of lies start to unravel and uh pope discovers a family secret and so this is uh we are in episode six at this point so i think i had said that we were only going to talk about five six is uh i believe john b is out of jail at this point they jj's plan works almost in like two episodes um and uh I believe Rafe has already tried to attack Sarah. Hold on, let me let me, I might be further than I thought. Let me see real quick. Sorry, I'm I might actually be further than I thought. Sorry. I'm really clear that it passed. I think I'm at... Let me check real quick. I think I'm at episode 7. I don't want to say I'm further than I am. I don't want to spoil myself, and I don't want to spoil y'all. Um, so... Let me see. I'll find out in two seconds. I'm in the middle of episode seven. Okay, so... Yeah, so... Okay, so... Druthers is the last episode I've basically watched. John B. bristles when uh, Sarah reconnects with a former flame. Ward's web of lies start to unravel. Pope discovers a family secret. And so, at this point, I'm just going to go for the Pope stuff. Pope and his family have basically uh, revealed that they are from the lineage, the same lineage of one of the slaves that was on the um, royal merchant that inherited the gold, I believe. I I might be a little bit wrong. I'll try to correct most of this when we get back to the the final episode. Um, And uh, just saying that, it feels a little convenient. I don't really know why. I don't, uh, like, no one, like, none of his family has ever talked about ever being related in that way. And I just feel like it's a little bit, uh, I don't know exactly how I feel about it. Like, convenient storytelling, maybe? I don't know. Uh, which also begs the question, who really owns the gold? Like, who's, whose gold is it supposed to be? Because when they went into the, you know, 
Don't Breathe Ladies House uh, in season one, and she had the gold in her basement. Is that not technically her gold? Was that crazy about her thinking that her that was her gold, and they're just like stealing from her? And John B's father w- would have eventually done that, but I mean, is that not theft? I'm I'm trying to figure out what's going on, and uh, which eventually Ward gets it, but uh, yeah. So, anyways. It's like, what the hell's going on? So, my druthers. Uh, at the end, uh, Ward's web of lies start to unravel. When they go to capture Ward and tell him, you know, you know, this is how it's going down. At the very end, he is like, all right, everyone. I'm on the yacht, and I'm saying my goodbyes. And the captain always goes down with a ship. And I was like, what? This is like intense i was like this guy is going to kill himself uh instead of actual or try to evade the cops on by boat like fucking miami vice what the hell does ward think this is um and so he has like the most dramatic ending that you could possibly have in front of his family i was like this does feel a little theatrical when it comes down to it you know, this guy, Sarah, Ward Cameron, is on his fucking boat saying his goodbyes to everybody. Basically, F you to John B. And uh, saying F you to the to the uh, policemen and everybody. And then you see the policemen coming in on the uh, on the boats and stuff like that. And he's like, buck that. And he runs downstairs and says, says, we'll see ya. And, like, there was nothing about... Ward's character that ever made me feel like this was how it was going to end for him. I knew it was going to be a destructive ending in a way, but not like a, I don't know how to describe it, but not like a ridiculously scarring ending for the, his family. I always felt like he was a guy that was trying to put his family first, but he was he was willing to do anything for the greed and the gold and to do that. But like to kill himself in front of his family, I felt like was not the way he, he would have done it. I know that for like the dramatic sake, it was the most dramatic you could have done it, you know, on the, on the ocean, on a really nice, right off the dock of a really nice place in front of everybody. Um, but yeah, I was like, holy shit, that guy just fucked himself up. <laughs> and after he had killed, uh, the airport guy at the beginning. Okay. So Ward as a character is an interesting guy. He just is willing to break and bend anything and everything he can to get what he needs and needs and do. And the thing is, he's being arrested by characters and policemen and police women, whatever, that are already dirty. So it feels like he, even if he was arrested, I, I felt like he would have had a plan to like get himself out. He, this guy doesn't feel like a guy that would just go kill himself like that. He feels like a guy that would have the money stashed away to have like the law, a law firm get him out in like 24 hours. If that, you know, this guy, in my opinion, Ward's character did not lead to him, you know, having this massive explosion at the end. Dramatically, maybe, yes, but, like, he didn't even try to, from the law standpoint, I feel like, he was already paying off the cops. He was already had the law on his side. So, I don't know. And and Officer Smiley, I forgot what the officer's name is with the mustache, the dirty officer in the first season. Um, He's, like, trying to be, like, a good deputy in this one, but it's kind of, like, hard to tell, like, what the show really thinks about the uh, authority figures, you know, the people in, you know, making the rules and, and stuff like that. Um, Cause they're not using the FBI. They have to use SBI. I don't, I don't know what the heck that is. Um, but anyways, uh, the, the aftermath, I, 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 I remember why I watched a little bit of episode seven now um, without going into detail, this, explosion and this the death of ward is only going to they basically fridged ward so it so they propelled the character of sarah cameron to go more to topper topper is the one that shows up right beside he's like he's he's the only one running in real time and everyone else is like Whoa, no. and topper's like <laughs> like he's going like ape shit down to like where Sarah Cameron and Sarah's like, ah, ah, 
And when that all that is going down, she's like looking at John, like for like comfort and stuff like that. And she's like, John, what are you doing? And John's like, yeah, let it burn. <laughs> John wasn't really that benevolent about it. He just was showing absolutely zero empathy to his quote-unquote wife. And just because he was pissed at her, uh, like a little bit, I guess. I don't know. And so he let Topper basically come back in. He, I, at this point, I don't even think he was interested in Sarah. I, I, don't, I had a feeling that there was like a, a bit of a stinger where, not a, not a literal stinger, but it was a bit of a two- two punch fold it's like fuck you ward and i'm going to you know marry your daughter kind of thing but when ward was dead he wasn't interested in sarah anymore i think it was kind of a a double-edged sword in that way um but yeah i was my my criticism about this season so far just watching these first six episodes is just like the rocky shores that we've been on the rocky waves we've been on this this season it's been very um, you know, zing, ding, 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 and uh, I haven't been having as much fun with season two, but it's still got these these really high and intense stakes. So, um, uh, I'm not really sure what season one had had the feeling about it that maybe Poke Life was really something you wanted to be a part of, and season two you realize you don't want to be a part of it. Maybe. But, uh, yeah, so let me know what you thought about Outer Banks Season 2, Episodes 1 through 6. Again, I apologize for having a discombobulated mind about it. I don't have the specific synopses right in front of me, so I kind of forgot how the series of events unfolded. But, um... Yeah, oh yeah, and we see J.J.'s father in jail, probably exactly where he belongs. He, he looks like he's still drunk. He's like, what's going on? What's going on? You know? And those cops are, like, intentionally being assholes to them. Like, taking J.J. in in the jail cell where uh, John B. is. Or not the jail cell, but taking where the visitor center is and making him pass pass where his father is and whatnot. It's just like, god dang. They're cruel. Cruel as fuck. And I'm curious, is J.J.'s father, like, in there for years? Because if they're in the jail for... I, I I figured the jail that they would be in on the on the island would be so much longer... Or, sorry, would be short-term versus off the island being long-term. I don't know. Don't don't really know. Anyways, yeah, the, the characters all have very very real things they have to deal with in season two. And I feel like that's what's taking away a little bit from the fun of season one. Um, there's just sense of like a hangoutness of season one where the, you know, the reggae music would start playing. That's my reggae music. <laughs> and anyways, you know, they'd just be like chilling and, you know, pogue life, pull up on a boat, jump on, pull up, on another boat, everyone just jumps on. Everyone just goes out to see. It, it looked like a nice hangout. And I don't feel like I'm hanging out, <laughs> if you know what I mean. So let me know what you thought about Season 2. Let me know if you feel like this is an organic season. Let me know if, about the whole Sarah Cameron and Topper of it all. Do you think it's going to end this way? I know a lot of people have already finished Season 2. Um, but let me know if you have any uh, predictions or whatnot. Again, we are streaming live on Twitch twitch.tv slash podcast. be sure to check out luggedoutpodcast.com for all of the social medias and all of the uh, the good things you can do to help support the podcast check out Aftercast 25 coming down the tube as well Aftercast are reviews on um, non-TV movie related uh, segments so let me know how to improve. Let me know what you thought about Outer Banks Season 2, 1 through 6. And take it easy.